From the Center for Music Learning, I'm Dr. Micah Killian, here with some thoughts on practice. If you're watching this video, you probably already know this, but uh, there's an abundance of material online promising seemingly simple ways to improve your performance or your practice. Uh, these are typically referred to as tips or tricks or maybe hacks. There's an attractiveness to the simplicity of a tip or a trick or a hack that makes it sort of digestible in social media. But the problem is that can seduce people into thinking that learning is as simple as following a tip or a trick. But that's not really how skill development works. And while many or maybe at least some of these suggestions can be helpful in getting you to think about or approach your music learning in a different way, uh, they all come with one limitation that is fundamental to how skills develop. The only way to get really good at something is by doing it a lot. To show you what I mean, uh, there's a, a really influential model of, of skill learning put out by researchers Fitz and Posner in the 1960s, where they outline these three broad stages to skill learning. There's the cognitive stage, followed by the associative stage, ending in the autonomous stage. Now, before I go into any details with each one of these stages, it's important to say that the boundary between these is not well-defined. It's not as if you wake up one day and you've moved from the cognitive stage to the associative stage, but it provides a pretty good broad framework for understanding how it is that humans get good at stuff. So up on the top, uh, early in learning, we have what's called the cognitive stage. And this is where information is ingested by a learner uh, and through cognition, through thinking, is turned into a movement. Let's say I'm taking one of my very first violin lessons um, and my teacher wants to show me how to hold the violin correctly. Um, they may model, so they'll hold the violin and I can get some visual information. I can see the way it looks. Uh, they may give me a few directives. They may tell me where to put my hands or my fingers. Um, so I get some verbal information. And then when I'm handed the violin, I use all of that information that I've gathered to make an attempt at holding the violin correctly. So following the cognitive stage, we reach what Fitz and Posner refer to as the associative stage. Um, this comes a little bit later in the learning process after an individual has already gathered some experiences or maybe some practice at a task. And this is where the bulk of learning really happens. To quote a Jeffrey Huber article that I'll, I'll link below, it's where we turn what to do into how to do. Or said another way, it's where we turn declarative information into procedural information. It's during this stage that actions become associated with outcomes. So movements that lead to task success, uh, cue little dopamine boosts in the brain, making those movements more likely to reoccur in similar situations in the future. And movements that don't lead to task success uh, are rewarded with a little less consistency, making them less likely to reoccur. Now, importantly, the learning in the associative stage is much slower than the cognitive stage, uh, smaller performance gains over time, because the movement adaptations that happen during the associative stage uh, require a lot of experiences. These adaptations, which happen primarily below conscious awareness, are the result of really small adjustments that happen trial by trial as we reduce the discrepancy between the way we want to sound and the way we actually sound. And following the associative stage, we have the autonomous stage. And this is late in learning a skill um, when movements can be executed pretty reliably and pretty consistently without any conscious attention. This frees up cognitive space to think about and pay attention to more subtle features of a task. Now, the reason I go into a little detail with this is to help illuminate maybe the fundamental flaw in how a lot of tips, tricks, and hacks are taught. The problem is that they can only really influence a skill at the cognitive level. They can be used to make conscious changes to how you do a task, but that's only the beginning of the process. It's not that tips, tricks, and hacks are useless or bad or harmful. Uh, it's just that they only represent the really beginning of a much larger process that's still always going to take time, experience, effort, 
uh, patience, probably some tenacity, <laughs> uh, in order to integrate them into anything resembling a consistent or reliable change in your behavior. Because, here's the thing, there's no shortcut to expertise. The fastest way to get really good at something is through really effective practice. So the next time you find yourself coming across someone that's got a, a trick or a hack for your practice, try it. But then get down to the real work of learning and adapt and refine your movements through lots and lots of experiences.